Hello, this is Brett Toasty. I'm the project leader for Battle for Naboo. Uh, today, we're just going to uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, different elements in the game. And I have with me um, Duncan Brown and Holger Schmidt. Duncan Brown is the um, lead level designer, and Holger Schmidt is the lead programmer. And we're just going to start talking about various elements of the game. This is Speed, the first level of the game. Um, we start out with the droid starfighters flying over the city, trying to recapture sort of the general character of the introduction to the movie when the Trade Federation is beginning its invasion. You see Gavin Sykes, our hero, driving through the city streets. Try, trying desperately to escape uh, the onslaught of the Trade Federation as it comes in. That's basically the idea of this level, that we start out with the invasion of, invasion of Seed and um, pretty soon the Queen will escape, but you have to make your own escape from the city. This um, first arena was uh, just spe specifically designed as like a larger open space where we could um, introduce droid Echis for the first time and um, have some fun shooting at them. Yeah, one of the ideas with, with Feed was uh, we all watched the movie and we saw the droid Echis and uh, the droid Echis were, in my opinion, one of the, yes. the fiercest enemies because even the even the Jedi Knight couldn't defeat them. They actually ran away from the droid Echis. So we were thinking, what a great enemy to have and be able to see up close. And one of the things when we were working on, on Rogue Squadron is, is you were always flying around and uh, we had some great detail, but you oftentimes couldn't see things up close. And so we wanted to create a, a level where you could see you could see the droid Echis rolling down the street. You could hear them, and then they would deploy, and you'd see the shield come up around it, and, and they would just start blasting the... <laughs> blasting the hell out of you, and we just thought that would be just one of the really cool elements of uh, Feed. Actually, uh, we started out this level as kind of an empty height map, as an empty environment, because Rogue was landscape-based, and placed buildings on that, but we quickly discovered that that was not the right way to go, and basically rewrote the engine to handle cities and um, do this kind of city level. And then the first go, I think, uh, was a little bit um, too tight. It was more like a, a maze kind of level, and because the engine basically is uh, is that that it's more like a maze engine, um, an indoors engine. We had to turn it into an outdoors engine, and um, so over the process of development, we widened up the levels. They became more open. This is KMBO, Nabu Public Radio. No it's not easy being green, being the color of the grass. Thank you. You will, you will edit this, I hope. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah thank God. Okay, level two. Um, I have Chris Kly here. He originally started the level, and uh, Sheng Sheng Zhu. Um, no, Sheng Dong Zhu. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> and uh, they will tell you a little bit about farmlands. Well, basically, we wanted to give the player an idea of what might exist in the hills beyond beyond Thie. So we thought, you know, it would be natural to put some some farmers out there, some small settlements and such, and you know, they they have. Oh, forget it. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> I don't know. I hate this. Um, I could. You could stop talking. But I, yeah, I don't want to talk anymore. Let me let me let me Thank give you over to. Uh, to no, no, you're to, doing fine. You're I'm not doing fine. That's the whole point. Um, yeah, one thing I like about this level is um, I, I just like the whole progression from from level one through this one to level three, where um, you really have this feeling that you're up against overwhelming odds. You really aren't beginning the game here on offense. I mean, basically, you're trying. You're you're running for your life, so that you hopefully can come back and and um, uh, in, in greater numbers to you know strong with stronger force to drive off the the trade federation. Okay. Do, well, I mean, Shane, you, you want to talk more about maybe some of the ideas of your first combat area? Uh, okay. Basically, first the combat area is a, a small village. Then uh, second combat area will be uh, the silo. But uh, the main objective there is not really protecting the whole Cyro, but more likely is you know make sure Captain is in a good condition, traveling through the farmland. 
then the main action chasing area actually is right after the silo area will be like about less than 30 seconds chasing fast speed chasing once you pass that it will be a, a big battle area is a like a windmill farmhouse that's the most dangerous area after that it's kind of like a take it easy relax listen to the music <laughs> enjoy enjoy the trip <laughs> we have nothing interesting to say i just realized this Okay, level three. Um, Sheng was also the level designer for level three, and this level evolved quite a bit. All we really knew was we saw some portions of the movie where we saw the um, the Gungans at their sacred place in the swamps, but we needed to elaborate on the swamps. We knew that Naboo was a wet planet. Well, being from Germany, of course, we know a lot about rain. Yeah. This is actually uh, kind of kind of the progression of level the first three levels. You see, is we thought, okay, we have to offer the game player something different than uh, than we did in Rogue. So we started out with this city level on a driving vehicle. Next was the farmlands, which is again a landscape, wide open area level, which uh, was a vastly improved um, engine from Rogue. And then you come into the third level, which is your first regular flying level, where you get similar gameplay that's very similar to Rogue. Proven concept, and it's just plain fun. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. I mean, the, the first three levels were, were trying to teach you three different aspects um, of the game, the first level being ground in a city to city, street to street fighting. The second level being almost flying, but it's hovering, it feels different. It's somewhere between ground and flying. And then the third level being just a training. So all three of these m missions are actually sort of training missions. Um, so they're not too difficult. You shouldn't underestimate also that um, the sound environment plays a big role in this level. You have the background thunders and it gives you a kind of a rainy atmosphere. Oh, that's that's quite true. It's a, I mean, if, if you listen, there's you know there's very subtle ambient sounds of the special effects of the rain of the you know the whole feel of the level from the music to the sound effects to the to the way that the objects look to the sky. Everything comes together to make it feel like it's uh, you're in the swamp. Where's my fish? Where is it? <laughs> it's a big goober fish is what it is. Because the heavy polluted environment in the pool, so the water is no longer transparency, all the fishes. I never saw the fish. He's somewhere. The fourth level in the game, this is sort of a change of chapter in the story because for the first three levels you are running away from the Trade Federation. On this level um, you get an opportunity to rescue somebody that potentially is going to ally to your cause. So really this is in a way the beginning of a, a new chapter where you're gathering together allies rather than running away from the Trade Federation. And um, Don Silky was the level designer for this level and he can give you some background information of how maybe this level evolved and changed. Right, originally uh, you're just supposed to be heading off into the mountains um, looking for the smuggler that you were informed was um, sort of camped out up towards the mountains. Uh, you come along uh, shortly after finding more people that are under attack and you're trying to do what you can to help rescue them in your search. Um, most of the planet of course is being decimated by the Trade Federation so, but you have this strange desire to force help even though it may be somewhat fruitless. What about this? Uh, the first area is you can give people a little player tip of if people haven't already discovered it. Oh, the, the first homestead that you come to that you've asked your captain to um, help protect. Um, if you do finally save the homestead, the person that lives in the house will leave, go to his garage and get his speeder. If you happen to rescue the speeder and follow the speeder to his other farming area, then that's where you will get a power up. Yeah, he basically activates his little garage door opener, opens the gate for you to get your power up. Of course, if you're seeing this cheat you've probably already figured out every single power up in the entire game so uh but if you haven't uh check it out it's kind of a cool little event yeah i mentioned it in the last level that both sound and music um help give an atmosphere to the game we have with us um, chris holzbeck and he designed a lot of the the original music obviously uh we tried to recreate a lot of the john williams uh music and it was chris's responsibility to do that but he also created a lot of original pieces. Chris, you wanna maybe talk a little bit about the music here? Yeah, well, I uh, specifically uh, chose level four because that was one of the levels where I really composed my own tracks uh, to the action. And um, 
there are about uh, four or five pieces in the level and they all are based on kind of the same theme or something. Um, there is a, uh, for example, if you meet the ally, the uh, smuggler, um, the music changes and uh, but still retains the um, the uh, feel of the first um, uh, track that you hear when you come into the level for the first time. Um, but it has a, s a specific theme for the uh, for the smuggler that comes in then. And um, there's also a lot of interactivity going on um, when uh, you enter an area where uh, you have to fight, for example, at that homestead, then the music changes and things like that um, to make the soundtrack a little bit more exciting. There's some other, there's some little Easter eggs on uh, this level. If you haven't noticed, we actually have the Pico Pico birds flying around. Just to try to give the atmosphere. This is a very lush um, planet, and um, you can, if you wanted to, you could actually even shoot down those birds. Um, sometimes the Trade Federation. Uh, early on, we were, we were talking yeah, about early on we had a bug where um, all the different characters either were enemy or friendly. We had no civilian, so. The, the staffs that were flying around on the roadway would actually shoot down the birds and you actually see this big ball of flame come flying down and hit the ground. It was pretty nasty. Poor little innocent birds just getting shot out of the sky. It's the only game with flaming birds. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to blow up. I'm sure players are now going to try and shoot down birds. <laughs> The idea with level five was um, to really get a progression of going from the city to the farmlands to the swamps, and then up into the mountains, and eventually to a, a you know a really cold and frigid region. I want to introduce um, Julian Egebrecht. Um, he is the president and um, of Factor Five, and also the producer of Battle for Nubu from the Factor Five side. And tell a little bit about controls and things. <laughs> I will do that. Yeah, um, I'm taking place more or less for our main control program, which was uh, um, who was Mike Keith, because Mike isn't around here. And uh, one of the one of the um, approaches we took um, was that for the flight levels, of course since Rogue Squadron was uh, such a great success. Mike started out by simply taking that control and plugging it uh, into our new engine and into our new environments. And taking it from there, um, the more interesting stuff, of course, were the ground craft, because it is relatively easy, um, at least especially if you've done the uh, Rogue before, to, um, to do the flight craft, but the ground craft asked for realistically hovering speeders, which should feel good in both the um, city environments and on the landscapes. And uh, there was a lot of tweaking going on and actually real physics. The trickiest part for um, uh, definitely was the, the water control um, because the watercraft, um, I mean, our ideal was to get a relatively realistic water bobbing up and down coupled with real playability, which in um, shoot 'em up terms isn't that easy to get because as soon as you get that realistic water feel, um, you also have a real problem aiming. So that was a very fine balance to be found and we tweaked and tweaked and tweaked endlessly. What came into play there um, uh, very well was that um, we set up um, an amount of physics items, basically, which everybody on the team, but most mostly Brett and, and the level designers, also could play around with to tweak the controls. Um, so um, somebody who really wanted to to who had good ideas to tweak the controls just right um, could access it and then basically play with the numbers um, and make. Um, make all of the little physics items uh, feel exactly right, and we hope it came across well. Maybe yeah, the the snow um, in this level once again uh, uh, came over from Indiana Jones. Courtesy um, of Indiana Jones. Courtesy of Indiana Jones, because in Indy we had this uh, we had two levels actually um, uh, in a sanctuary and. Um, a river where basically we needed snow effects um, and uh, well they just uh, by pure luck also fit this level pretty well. It was all planned that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, this is um, something we actually didn't want to do too much on, on Rogue Squadron. Um, we wanted to do a terrain-based um, game on Rogue Squadron and really show off uh, ground-based combat. Everybody always said in Rogue Squadron, geez, we wish it was in space, but uh, really it was by design we didn't want to do space. But this time around, we, we realized um, a lot of the customers do want to go up and fly in space. You see it in the movies. But we wanted to have all the combat to stay around Naboo. So we really thought of ways in which we could incorporate at least a couple space levels around the planet of Naboo and um, 
and give the players what they wanted, which was just you know all out free for all chaos space battle. I have with me here uh, Reed Derleth, and he is a person that designed and created um, level seven, actually level six in the game. Yeah, the it, it really was designed to be pretty much a dogfighting level. Just uh, you have some bit, you have a basic structure, which is killing the shield generators, and you're supposed to be set upon by starfighters, and they it, they actually follow you around the level, and they're pretty smart about where to go if you decide to focus on the different comp stats and they'll chain off under different in, in different ways and follow you around. Well there was um, on the levels on level six what we did is we the whole idea here was to disrupt the whole trade federations communication on sort of the, the backside of the planet because in the movie we see the droid control ship it really controls all of the droids or at least it turns them on and off um, so we thought hey if, if we had like a relay satellite on the backside of the planet and if we knocked this thing out we could later go back down to the planet and really stick it to them this is a this is a different again a different chapter sort of in the game this is where you're really starting to stick it to the trade federation up until this point for the first five levels you were you were destroying them somewhat, but this level is just a free for all. We're going to destroy everything that is the Trade Federations. Uh, a little pro tip about the Comsat: when you destroy the turrets, each of the missile turrets, it actually damages the Comsat for about twice the cost of the damage of the missile turrets. So you're advised to take those out first, and then you only have a little bit left to go on the main Comsat to finish the level. And of course, the, on the art side, I mean, the um, the planet was was quite a challenge to get a really nice looking planet there. Um, we did a lot of reiterations of trying to get it to look just right and get the, the correct um, stratosphere effect down below. And A lot of credit goes to Molly Mendoza for, uh, yes. for pulling off the texture of the, of the planet. Who did the rotation on the uh, satellites? The Jens. Jens did that? Yep. That really added a lot. It was great. Yes, Jens did a lot of our um, special effects. The explosions and rotations and things like this. Okay, level seven. Um, level seven again. Uh, we were what we were going for was really icy icebergs. Um, again, a really different type of look than what we've seen in most games. Um, seems like most games do nice rolling snow or something boring. What we really wanted was um, to feel like you were maybe up in Alaska and. Um, a different type of feel and this is also a continuation off of the space level because the space level you've broken down the satellite um, now this base is temporarily um, disabled um, Michael Licht here was the uh, level designer here um, actually it was sort of challenging because he took this level over um, from another level designer so this is definitely um, w was sort of a challenge for him you want to talk a little bit about the level? Sure, sure um, essentially, I think level seven was a, a chance for the the player for the first time to really cut loose. A lot of the levels are very structured and, and rigid in their events and in their activities, and this is one of the few that really allows you to sort of uh, just blast whatever's in sight. And I think it's a good chance for a player to kind of cut loose a little bit. Um, I try to encourage the player to stay with his wingman, and if he goes off too far, there are punishments, of course. But uh, with the amount of turrets and mines and everything else you're going to run into this level, it's a really good idea to play with your wingman, follow them through, they know the way uh, to get to the end of this level. Um, and, be and also because it's such a non-linear level, you really, you can get lost for a long time. So stick with your wingman and fight with them, and, uh, and you, you know, I think you'll have a, a really good time on this one. So also keep your eyes open um, for there is a fun little bonus on this one. Uh, like I said, feel free to blow up whatever you find, because you can only get more and more points for it. And eventually you'll find a, a pretty hearty bonus and some uh, some exciting stuff towards the end of this level. And uh, one helpful tip, always go for the missile turrets first, because they will certainly go for you first. Level 8 in the game, um, this is the first introduction of a water-based craft, and uh, this gave us you know, new challenges, um, but we, we really wanted to have air, ground, and water vehicles, um, so we, we decided to have this sort of trek up the river um, to eventually free the, uh, 
free the prisoners in the prison camps. John File here is um, was the lead level designer for this level, and he can tell you a little bit of backstory. Um, Brett approached me about this level, and uh, he said that he wanted a spooky feeling about it, that he wanted it to remind him of, of Apocalypse Now. And uh, I tried really hard to do that. I knew that I wanted it to be very dark, and so uh, uh, we, we worked very hard to to get the lighting in so that it was very spooky and very dark. Uh, and uh, uh, to further the spooky feeling, uh, right now you won't be hearing any music, just uh, background noises. So if you're, you're listening to the, the, the music right now, you're actually not listening to music right now, it's just crickets, thanks to our uh, master sound man, Rudy. Some of the things that I noticed when we were first building this level was that uh, the gunboat is is slightly unwieldy. It's it's big, you know, it's a big armored vehicle in, in the, the river. River. And so uh, I realized that that the gameplay for this this uh, this boat was was kind of hard when you're rushing around trying to fire at things. It's very hard to aim it and turn and and move around in the water all at once. But when you stop it and you uh, use it as pretty much a, a mobile turret, that's when it, its true strengths come around. Uh, once you get to the 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 first lake, uh, some people have a hard time with this this part because it it feels like a thousand things are firing at you at once. There's bombers bombing and mines floating and lasers shooting and and uh, one of the secrets that you've probably found out by now is, is the fact that if you don't shoot any bombers on the way through the lake you won't wake up the camp. Uh, the level right now takes me you know around 10 minutes to do. Um, I usually get bronzes or silvers. I, I'm pretty much kind of lackadaisical when it comes to playing this level. One of the things that people like about this level is the fact that you're not actually guarding anybody uh, while you're playing it. Uh, you are trying to free prisoners but uh, this is one of those special levels where where you're not trying to like help a convoy somewhere or escort somebody some uh, someplace. It's basically just destroy the heck out of everything you see and you win. One element that I really like on this level is uh, <clears throat> the mines that you, when you're going up the river, and actually even in the, the lakes, you'll see some of these mines. And um, these mines are the idea with the mines was that, that they actually have a magnetism to the player, and so you'll see that they start drawing toward the player. Uh, yeah. One, once again, the, the the sound for the mines is, is very very cool, where it finally catches you with its magnetism. You can hear them coming up at you, and sometimes those mines will follow you around, and uh, that's a pretty scary experience when a mine is locked onto you and and uh, has, is starting to follow you down the river. I, I like this level a lot. Uh, it's, yes, uh, of course he does. Oh well, <laughs> I, 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 I like it just not only because I have a huge ego, but <laughs> because uh, um, because it, the gameplay in it is is so much different than previous levels where you are uh, in action at all times. Level nine, right after you freed the prisoners. Um, at the end of the river, um, you continue to escort them up the river into Jeff's level. This is also Jeff Jones' um, second level of the game. I want to give a little bit of first level of the game. Oh, yes, it is his first level. It's my, my mistake. Um, this is Jeff Jones' first level of the game, um, and he can give you a little bit of um, insight to maybe how this level evolved and how it's changed through the evolution. Well, one of the things I wanted to show here was the uh, Trade Federation really doing some damage. Uh, you don't see that in the movie, but you can imagine they would go through and uh, really kick some butt when they're provoked and try to pull that off with the town. Um, another thing that it, it interested me about the level was uh, the idea of doing a chase up the canyons. Uh, when I lived in Colorado, I used to uh, imagine ships flying up the canyon on uh, Highway 6 from Golden into the mountains, which I frequented as I was going skiing. Somewhere in the level you'll find Devil's Tower from Wyoming. That's uh, something I'm trying to put into every game I work on. You'll see it in uh, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. It's in the bonus level, Return to Peru. Funny thing as we were working on this level, the uh, boats as they are trapped on the lake would uh, talk way too much as they were taking damage and say, we're wounded Nunas here way too many times and we're taking heavy fire, but we got that toned down. Hopefully it sounds about right to you. Well, if I was allowed to talk about AI or basic design philosophy behind this game, it kind of takes me back to uh, the sandbox battles. I guess everybody fought in their sandbox with the little starfighters and the little X-wings back when Star Wars was out. And um, you kind of do a choreography of your of your own battle. And um, 
because you always win. And uh, I think that's that's how a lot of the level design was done, choreographing their own epic battle. This level is really a sort of a transition level too. And as you'll see throughout our entire game, we have um, we try to we try to have transitions between our different environments. Where one level leaves off, the next level picks up. Um, this level really accomplishes a lot of things. It starts off um, in the water. You quickly go up, you go out onto the land, and then from going onto the land, you slowly start rising up into the hills to eventually get up into ruins, which we thought, when we saw the movie, we said, wow, there's these um, ancient ruins that the Gungans are using to, um, to take refuge in against the Trade Federation. Um, and we thought, you know, there's obviously this ancient civilization that existed probably um, before the Gungans or the Nibu, I don't think either one of them know exactly who are these people that built these ancient ruins. And we thought, wow, it would be really cool to have the Nibu citizens eventually get to some other ruins up in the mountains. Um, and so that's how this level concludes. Um, and that was some of the thinking behind of having these ruins back there. Okay, here is level 10, and this was another one of Don's levels, and I'll let Don and Holder give you basic facts about the levels and, and give some insights, some basic facts. All right, well, the basic premise of the level is you started out in the last um, level hearing from a pilot that has just returned that your captain has gone down. Um, the main thing is that you are to go and locate where he is and try and rescue him. Um, along the way, uh, you will run into more Trade Federation that is, of course, pillaging and plundering your planet and you eventually will run across a mining operation that is actually being controlled by your smuggler and that you had no idea of this operation that was actually running. Um, it is currently under attack by the Trade Federation and your first priority is to um, get him out of trouble because of course he was with your captain when he went down so you need to get the information of how to find your captain. I am going to chime in here a little bit. This is the, the first opportunity that you you see that the the smugglers may have had another motivation to ally with you that basically they also wanted to steal some of the resources on Naboo not just the Trade Federation and so all along you were um, you were duped a little bit by them by thinking that they would actually help you and of course the smugglers are the boss of the smugglers is a hut and huts we all know um, they're gangsters they're criminals and we allied with criminals because we thought they would help us uh, throughout the game and and you really see that they're they're excavating they're they're taking the ancient uh, ruins and and using them for themselves and on this level you have no idea uh, what's happened to your captain and you quickly discover what his fate is. Well, it shows you that there's only one honest smuggler, and that's Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, uh, while you're in the mining operation, uh, you will rescue the, the, the smuggler's operation from uh, the Trade Federation, and of course, when you ask for his help, he is all of a sudden no longer uh, quite as receptive to giving you help. Um, his priorities have changed, and now you are no longer his buddy. Um, at this point, uh, you ask for information, he refuses to give it to you, and you decide you want to take it by, get the information by force. Um, in the meantime, he is trying to steal crystals that it turns out will actually um, can be used as a great power source uh, if you enter the mining operation you will actually find that it helps power your shields and give you some extra life and fighting while he is trying to pillage the planet. I notice there's a lot of shooting in this game. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's some very fine voice acting at the end. Um, okay, level 11 is another level that um, John worked on, and we also have um, Thomas Engel here that doing a whole variety of tasks, including um, a lot of the sound effect implementations and um, other things, so uh, welcome. Hi there, uh, hope you enjoyed the cheat. Uh, all right, uh, this this level is, is basically a boss level. Uh, you're going around trying to defeat the evil Borbo the Hutt because you found out that he is actually stealing prisoners from the Trade Federation and turning them into slaves. Uh, some of the difficulties that we had when we were uh, designing this this level was to, to give the, the player a good sense of, of, of being right in the middle of a chaotic dogfight. And I think that we've done a pretty good job about this. Actually, they, they gave us, the level designers that just gave us 
pretty hard job uh, adding uh, sound effects to all this. There's uh, much more even than in earlier games. We have, uh, well, uh, dogfight situations, mm -hmm. lots of engines going off and lots of lasers flying around. Uh, there are other places in the game too. And, uh, right. puts quite, quite a bit of stress on, on the little N64. It's, it's a pretty good job, though. Um, uh, the, the sounds sound very good. Though the whining of the smuggler ships as, as they pass over you and around you and through you and, uh, and as you explode <laughs> uh, uh, is uh, is very very compelling, very realistic. It, it really really adds to the excitement of the level. Actually, just the fact that you can hear all of the different. I mean, there's so many different sounds that you're hearing. I mean, you're hearing the lasers, you're hearing the engines, you're hearing the lasers as they whiz by your head. You're hearing um, if you're shooting down an enemy, you're hearing that. And sometimes you're hearing all of those things simultaneously. Along with music. Yeah, and along with music and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> quite, definitely quite a task. Right. Yeah, it's certainly just, just turn down the volume, of course, after this commentary is over, and uh, <laughs> just play it without sound. It uh, really is n not that enjoyable at all anymore. As, as we can see from playing this silent in front of us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, since you guys don't need to get the sound twice. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, uh, when most people see this level, they, the first word out of their mouth is green. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's green. <laughs> it's green. It's very green. Um, uh, but uh, um, I think that it packs a lot of excitement for the buck. It's not easy being green. Level 12. Michael Licht was a level designer, but we also have um, Sigmunds back and Brian Kruger's here. Um, you guys can talk about the level, talk about programming, whatever you want. I started out with one basic notion was that we had to find this uh, this uh, ever elusive Camp 4, and we only briefly hear about it in the movie. We never actually see. We don't really know what goes on in it, so it left a lot open for design. Um, my initial thought was um, uh, was uh, that it was just going to be a standard prison camp, and you went up and you have guard towers and what have you, and then we started. I got into a sort of ecological mood and I thought, well, what if not only is it a prison camp, but it's also sort of a, a labor camp and they're stripping the planet of their resources and they're using the ruins as slaves, whatever. So the first half of the level, I came up with an idea of sort of this 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 journey to find the prison camp rather than just stumbling right on it. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, well, if you'll notice in the first part of the level, there isn't even a, a, a pointer to even show you where to go. It really is, a, it's just an open adventure here, probably the only time in the game where there is no pointer. You just, you, you stumble on all these activities and your wingmen are, are going, look what they're doing here and look what they're doing there. And it, and it gives you a chance to really roam free for, for a while here and, and, uh, and really, um, and search, you know. There's a lot of things that get in your way and a lot of great ways to get points and to save friendlies and such. So um, my recommendation on the on the first half of this level is uh, is a uh, stick once again stick by your wingmen because they do know the best route and they do know where the, all the friendlies are to be saved and listen for the cues because farm houses will be attacked and people will be screaming for bloody mercy all over the level so when you hear something happen keep your ears open and go for it and uh, if you can save a farm or two it will definitely help your final score because there's a big cumulative friendly save at the end of this level. On a technical level, this is the biggest level in the game. It's actually two levels. It was designed in two different pieces. So there's this first piece where you find the camp, and then you'll notice a pause in the middle of the of the middle of the level in the cutscene, and then you're playing uh, the rest of the level, which is the actual prison camp itself. And there's an awful lot going on in the prison camp with lighting. You'll see a lot of shadows underneath the walls. You'll see searchlights. Quite a bit of special effects in this level, and from a technical standpoint, one of the more difficult challenges. Uh, this is also a quite typical uh, traditional height map level where uh, yeah, one thing we wanted to improve on from road was to draw distance. And uh, uh, one way to achieve that was to, to have the, the textures paid, paid off in the distance and, and go into a more cheap, grow shaded version of the height map as you are far away. Yeah, uh, one thing about the height map, there is, um, I need to say this about the height map, and that is Waka Wa! <laughs> so, <laughs> which is Norwegian for excellent. <laughs> um, well, you can you can see in this level we are pulling the old um, programming trick that uh, we make the level a little bit darker so you can see the light because if you have a broad daylight uh, kind of scenario you won't see any light. So this level shows you nicely how the lasers. Um, reflect on the on the uh, landscape and light the surroundings. 
Okay, this level was also designed by um, Michael Licht, and I should say that uh, although I've been very generous in giving everybody credit for the design, I, I also came up with um, a lot of the design for these levels. I have to, you know, I, I, I have to toot my own horn occasionally, um, but uh, Thomas is still here with us, and uh, Holder's here with us. Maybe we can get a little bit more of the, the technical aspects of, of sounds and special effects and... Uh, oh, you want to know trade secrets here. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty funny if you would have seen this game, I think about two months before we were done, you'd say, oh, this is boring, nothing is happening, because oh. basically the whole AI and the whole gameplay was there, but we didn't have any special effects, and they just add so much to a game, having special effects, having explosions and having sounds um, um, attributed to everything adds so much to a game. Jens would probably kill me for mentioning his name, but yes, Jens did uh, most of the, the effects programming in terms of graphical effects. It's unfortunately busy right now, so not with us, but uh, yeah, I really already said a, a very true thing there. It's, uh, it's just amazing, especially for shooters uh, and, uh, and this kind of kind of scenery, like what uh, effects actually do to the whole thing. Uh, added, of course, cutscenes and, and all that kind of movie type setting that you have. Actually, uh, time is pretty tricky to achieve this. Uh, well, N64 is hard for by now. It's a couple of years old, and uh, people uh, are used to uh, a lot of visuals in the TV and in the movies, especially. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty high high mark to get to. It's definitely a collaboration between uh, level design, um, you know, the AI, the sound effects, the music, the cutscenes. Um, they all have to, you know, on, on all the artwork, they all have to come together to give an impression that you're actually at the location that you're playing the game. If you're playing Battle for Nubu and you're you're leaning sideways as you're turning the, the vehicles, or if you're flinching when the explosion happens and you're crashing to the to the ground, then we've done our job and um, you're feeling at least for a moment like you're actually inside the, the okay. game system. Just be sure to hook it up to uh, uh, Dolby Surround Amplifier. Uh, it's, uh, this is uh, really quite nice uh, if you have uh, the things zipping around you, not just uh, in front of you. Go ahead. Uh, just a few comments about the, the gameplay design in this level. Um, this is a this level really is a, a timing issue, and uh, it's important to sort of get a move on here, especially in the beginning, because if you waste too much time, and like like the level says, you really you're supposed to stop this convoy from reaching this destination, and then if you if you don't get there in time, and they make it past a certain point, then you lose. So it's not really it's not a timer, but there is this convoy that's going to make it to the end. So get a move on, fight your way through the mines and everything else, and then also take note that you're not in a fighter here. This isn't about dog fighting. This isn't about you know strafing areas with with gunfire. As a matter of fact, this thing's pretty slow and it doesn't shoot very fast. Um, use your bombs. Make sure like 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 all the levels, blow up as much as you can. You'll be surprised at what is actually blowable on this level. And also use the bomb wisely. Blowable word. <laughs> 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 Can we edit that part out? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. The blow upable part has to stay. Oh, or you just send it to your third grade English teacher and say, <laughs> you invented the What's the word? past tense of blow up? Or what is the. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> now we should stop the online commentary because everybody ran out of ideas. Oh, dear. Okay, you've waited the entire game for this level. This is the level where you um, <laughs> finally get to come back to Thede and, and wreck havoc. And this is also a Reed Dareless level. That was essentially, logically, there's no reason that you shouldn't be running away also from this level because the it's still taken over by the, the Trade Federation. They still have a lot more troops than you, so... How about but the, not, but now you have more firepower and friends? You have more firepower, but you also have got a goal in mind, and that's to get to the other end, and run and gun, and kill as many things as possible, and confuse the Trade Federation. You're not here to to kick them out personally, you're here to get to the other end and uh, and, ha and get the pilots to the hangar. Probably just got noticed that the princess is back and she Exactly. The, the whole. That's just my theory. <laughs> <laughs> the whole level. Save the princess. That's the principle. Save the princess. <laughs> this is the <laughs> level. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, you. Uh, the whole level leads up to what is the, the final point of the level is supposed to be the movie scene uh, where you blow up the tank like they do in a movie, and uh, the Tanaka and the Jedi and the Princess can run inside the hangar and they can then lead you to the next level. The levels was inspired by a few things. The design was inspired <clears throat> firstly by Duncan Brown's level one, his earlier theme level, which, is, which taught me a lot about how to stack the buildings and that, but also by a visit I took to uh, Venice in 
April, and uh, the Riverside stuff has a touch of Venice. You, if you've been to Venice, you won't say, that looks like Venice, but maybe you'll get a sense of uh, that it's kind of close, that it's inspired by it. I was in Venice as a little child. Much <laughs> 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 like Anakin. Yeah, I, remember, I remember getting sick on spaghetti. <laughs> Ah, the new personal stories. You have <laughs> really good ice cream. Gelato. Oh, gelato. It's the best. Yeah. Yes. Visit Venice. <laughs> I, I uh, it looks like seed. It still mm. looks a lot. Like Actually, the, the seed uh, in the movie was based a lot on Venice. That was one of like three principal cities that they used for their inspiration. Unfortunately, I forgot the other two. But. <laughs> uh, I bet it was Cologne. Cologne, yeah. <laughs> <Feed>, of course. Seed <laughs> roll in the movie. One thing we decided was well, just made for good fun gameplay was that pretty much everything can get blown up the bushes the trees the pots and uh, initially things weren't all blow upable <laughs> ah, there it is that, that's the key theme the, the, blow, uh, the <laughs> secret word for today <laughs> blow upable The final level of our game, or at least the final regular level of our game. Um, if you haven't earned it already, um, we do have some bonuses and secrets. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but um, earn them, play those levels, get those medals, and you will see bonuses. If you do not do that, this is your final level. And Jeff Jones was the level designer of our final level 15. Jeff, you want to be talking about some of the many challenges of this uh, this level? And uh, certainly feel free to, to chime in here, Holger, with uh, some of the technical problems of displaying one of the biggest objects I've ever seen on the N64. It's big. <laughs> it's very big. Yeah, a lot of people thought that it couldn't be done, and, and I'm really impressed that we got it in there. A lot of credit goes to Holger for getting that in. It's big. Some advice I got from a level designer over at LucasArts was never do the last level in a game, and unfortunately I didn't listen. It was quite a challenge. But uh, anyway, the first half of this level is just pure dogfighting, which is really tough in space with nothing to to uh, keep the player in any given area, uh, not even satellites. But uh, we got it sort of working, and uh, it's definitely challenging. Uh, the second half, where you fight the droid control ship, was... Uh, really challenging because we want it to be true to the movie. If, if you're not true to the movie, then you know why bother doing a game about the movie? But we also wanted to give the player something to do. And in the movie, he didn't really do much. Anakin did all the work. So, or so it seemed. Or so it seemed, yes. Um, so we came up with some objectives. We uh, we understand from the technical specifications that this droid control ship has tractor beams. And we figure, while you weren't watching, uh, those beams were actually on in the movie and causing some trouble. So you have to shoot those. Or Anakin can't fly into the droid control ship. There are four of them, and we take one of them out for you in a cutscene to show you exactly what to do, since they're not uh, easily distinguishable on the surface of the ship. And then uh, after you've done that, you take out the shield generator, which is on the back of the ship, sort of where the, the neck meets the ring. And the idea there is that the shield generator protects both, the shields protect both the ship itself on the outside, but also on the inside. And once you take the shields down, you, the player is thinking, or the character is thinking, that he can now start shooting the ship, but instead Anakin blows it up from the inside because its insides are no longer shielded. So he really just got lucky. He really, well, he, he had some help. Well, yes, he got and, lucky. And he had the Force. And the Force, the midi chlorians. Um, anything you want to add to that? It's big. <laughs> <laughs> Size has its problems on N64. Size does matter. <laughs> Indeed. And wider is not necessarily better. And I had a lot of help on this level from my dog Sammy, who came in on the weekends and, uh, and helped me fix bugs. Licked his feet while he was... Uh... <laughs> Bark at Shin. Bark at Shin and, and, yeah. and Brett. Anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed the game. Uh, we enjoyed making it for you guys. And uh, yeah, you, you may want to add anything. But, um, <clears throat> thank you for listening to our comments. I want to thank my parents for giving birth to me. And um, this is for everyone out there. Thank you. No, <laughs> there is no big audience here. You won't get a golden little guy. Uh, well, someday I will.